Hello. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this session in, on placing humans at the center of artificial intelligence. My name is Anna Korhonen, and I'm a professor of natural language processing here in the University of Cambridge. I'm here with two colleagues today. Uh, first, John Suckling, who is a director of research in psychiatric neuroimaging, and then um, Parula Christensen, who is a professor of um, interactive systems engineering. Now, the three of us work in different departments in Cambridge, and we, in fact, we work in different schools in Cambridge. But what we share is that we all work on artificial intelligence in, on different aspects of it. And we are here today to talk about our joint mission, which is to make human artificial intelligence more human-centric and more focused on human needs. And we are also going to be telling you about the new center that we are setting up in Cambridge, which will be dedicated to this course. Now, we will kick off this session by showing you a presentation that we have put together for you. And after the presentation is over, we are happy to answer any questions you may have. And while the presentation is showing, uh, feel free to already post questions to us through Zoom. Thank you and see you soon. Hello. I will start my presentation by explaining why it's now important to place humans at the center of AI development. And I will then tell you about the new center for human-inspired AI in Cambridge that we are now setting up. In recent years, Artificial intelligence has dominated news headlines. After decades of AI-inspired science fiction, we are now living in the era of AI and are all affected by this technology one way or the other. Perhaps the most incredible thing about AI is the speed at which it has developed. Within a very short time, in less than a decade, AI has grown from an academic specialty area to a global phenomenon and is now transforming our world almost faster than we can grasp. We can now see that this technology has huge positive potential to address global problems, ranging from poverty to pandemics and large-scale conflicts to climate change. At the same time, it is far from perfect and comes with significant risks, raising concerns over misinformation, safety, privacy, inequality and other issues. As academics and technologists, we are now at the critical point where we need to make an urgent, conscious effort to align the development of this technology with the best interests of humanity. Our most critical challenge is to improve AI with human level capabilities. Ideally, tomorrow's AI should be better aligned with human intelligence so that it can understand human condition in all its forms. It should be responsible, compatible with humans, and designed from the ground up to support social and global progress. The development of this next generation, what we call human-inspired AI, is very challenging because it will have to be a collective effort. From the academic perspective, it is no longer only about AI researchers advancing AI models but it requires interdisciplinary collaboration between AI and a wide range of human-centric disciplines, ranging from humanities to social, cognitive, brain, biomedical, clinical and environmental sciences. For true progress and real-life impact, engagement with industry, policymakers, non-governmental organisations and civil society is also necessary. The urgency for this type of human-inspired AI is now widely recognized by the AI community and stakeholders. The question for us is, how can the University of Cambridge help and contribute? Our university is actually ideally placed to advance human-inspired AI. Cambridge is world leading in AI and across the many disciplines that are now relevant for it. We have AI researchers creating new machine learning, robotics, computer vision and other forms of machine intelligence, as well as philosophers, humanists and social scientists investigating ethics, trust and the implications of AI for humanity. We have also many interdisciplinary collaborations using AI to address challenges such as the climate change, 
discovery medicine, urban design and others. We are embedded within a vibrant community of commercial enterprise, have strong voice with policymakers, and importantly, have a unique mix of academic expertise unseen elsewhere. Being located here in the UK and Europe, we can also contribute our unique perspective to global debates in this area, many of which have so far been taking place in North America. This is why we are now setting up the Centre of Human Inspired AI in Cambridge, a truly interdisciplinary centre dedicated to advancing AI for the benefit of humanity. This centre will draw together interested researchers across the university, industries as well as other stakeholders to form a community that we hope will lead in innovation, application, education and impact. In innovation, our goal is to encourage breakthrough interdisciplinary AI research. To achieve this, we will establish a set of broad research programmes in human-inspired AI. These programmes will range from fundamental human-level AI to responsible, social, interactive, cognitive, creative and health and global AI. Committed to our mission to support humanity, we will apply advances in human-inspired AI to benefit applications in many critical domains. Healthcare, food poverty, urban design, education, climate science and economic sustainability are examples of some of the many domains that our researchers have expertise in. In this type of applied research, our collaboration with industry will be particularly important. Educating the next generation of AI creators and leaders is one of our key goals. We will establish dedicated graduate programs where students are educated in an interdisciplinary environment with access to all the expertise needed for human-inspired AI, including the technical, ethical, human and industrial expertise. To ensure impact, we will establish an extensive network consisting of local, national and international partners. We will organise forums around timely concerns, including business, social and ethical concerns. And we'll run a series of events with wider participation from all the stakeholders encouraged. If you share our mission to advance AI for the benefit of humanity, there will be plenty of opportunities to get involved. Our forums and events will be open to all the stakeholders, including the general public, and you are warmly welcome to take part in this and make your voice heard. Financial support is also welcome to ensure that the centre has the resources needed for innovative research. If you are interested in any of these opportunities, do feel free to get in touch with us. Now, to give you a more concrete idea of the type of research that our centre will be supporting, we will next interview some of our researchers and students working on different aspects of human-inspired AI. Hello and welcome. With me is Dr. Timothy Rittman, Senior Clinical Research Associate at the University of Cambridge, Honorary Consulting Neurologist at Addenbrooke's Hospital and Clinical Lead of the QMNC trial that is testing artificial intelligence for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Rittman, how do you discuss with patients that their diagnosis has been made by artificial intelligence? I think the first thing to say is that we're not looking to use this AI system in isolation. So the usual memory clinic process of seeing a person, talking to their relatives, taking a history, doing an examination and other tests all still stands. So the way I would see the AI um, fitting into that is giving us additional information. So getting as much information, say, out of the neuroimaging as we can. So the way I would phrase this to people when I'm talking about a diagnosis would be to say, well, you know, from what you've told me, from the cognitive tests that you've had, and from what I can see on the scan, that tells us you know, A, B and C. If we look at the imaging with the AI, it tells us uh, this extra information. I think how much we go into detail of you know, how the AI works, I think it would be very individual. Some people will just be happy with that. Some people may want to know a bit more about you know, exactly what it's doing under the bonnet. So we can explain to people that this is looking at, you know, in, in the case of neuroimaging and the AI and machine learning models that I've been working with, we're looking at thousands of people with scans who have dementia or don't have dementia, and we're looking for patterns within those scans and within the cognitive tests that we can't see with the naked eyes. 
kind of questions do patients have about the AI system? I think people's uh, understanding of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning uh, varies quite a bit. Um, and so the questions people ask will, will vary quite a bit depending on that. We've done a little bit of, informa of, of uh, scoping, talking to pe relatives of people with neurodegenerative diseases um, and dementia and asking them about the use of, of AI. And so far, people have been very positive, which is, is great. They, you know, they've said to us, well, you know, we use AI in all sorts of things already. It tells us what we, you know, what we might want to buy on websites. It's used in, in shops and, and other places. Why wouldn't you use it um, for diagnosis of dementia in, in medical contexts? Is there a tension if the AI system's output contradicts the doctor's intuition? Well, we use a number of tests in the clinic already, uh, from brain scans, from, say, lumbar punctures, um, from neuropsychology, uh, and some, sometimes those tests do contradict what I think about the, the diagnosis, having spoken to the person um, myself. So, in a sense, that's a problem we already have in clinic when uh, the, the tests don't match up with, uh, with our uh, so initial thought. Um, so, um, it, yes, it, it could be a problem if the AI contradicts the, the doctor's intuition. What we need to do with these tests as clinicians is get to know them and get to get used to when they work well and when they work badly. And that's something we, we, we do with a lot of, of tests, um, you know, even other blood tests and so on. As a doctor, um, I know, for example, that um, if I'm looking for someone with a pulmonary embolus, which is a clot in the lung, one of the tests I can do is a blood test called a D-dimer. Now, if that test is positive, um, it tells us that there might be a, a, a pulmonary embolus, um, but there's lots of other causes for that test being positive. If it's negative, I know it rules out a pulmonary embolus. And it's the same with the, uh, the AI. We need, to, um, we need to get to know the test. Um, some people you know, ask me, well, how accurate does the test need to be? How accurate does the AI need to be to be useful in clinic? And there's a slightly flippant answer to that as well. It doesn't matter how good it is, as long as we know how bad it is. Um, you know, we know where it fails and what the situations are in which it doesn't work well. So that's something that we'll have to work through, sort of practically implementing these kinds of things into the clinic. Why are people excited by AR glasses? So augmented reality glasses allow you to seamlessly integrate digital content into your physical world. So for example, I can create a virtual TV showing a video and put it on my wall or convert the surface of my table into an interactive touch panel. So with these capabilities, you can potentially perform many of the tasks you might normally need to pull out a smartphone or a computer for. For example, if I receive a message from a friend, I can see the notification in my field of view, read the message and then type off a quick reply without ever needing to pull out a phone. Another example might be presenting turn by turn instructions that are overlaid on the path in front of me, allowing me to maintain complete attention of my surroundings as I walk down an unfamiliar street. So these are just some trivial everyday use cases, but you can probably also imagine many other potential applications of AR glasses in the industry, for example, to present contextual maintenance instructions to an uh, engineer or to overlay real-time diagnostic data on equipment on a factory floor. So this ability to perform tasks for which you might normally require a smartphone or computer suggests that AR glasses could very well mean the, that these other devices become uh, redundant in some circumstances. So currently, AR glasses are relatively bulky and provide somewhat cl cl clunky interactions, but as the form factor and technology improves, it seems very likely that AR glasses will emerge as a viable replacement for carrying a smartphone. And certainly major device manufacturers are betting on this outcome with AR glasses either already released or in active, active development by the likes of Microsoft, Apple, and Facebook. How can AI enable a better experience for AR glasses? AI will be critical to providing an enjoyable user experience for AR glasses. So there are many new challenges that arise from injecting virtual content directly into the physical world. So for example, we ideally want virtual content to blend in with the physical environment, both in terms of its style and appearance, but also in terms of you know, logically consistent placement. Also, where possible, we don't want content to obscure people's view of the physical world. So we don't want them bumping into objects because of the virtual content that's placed in front of them. 
So addressing these two requirements is challenging for those developing applications for AR, given that they cannot know, these developers cannot know in advance the many varied locations in which their applications will be used by users. So AI will be essential here to allow virtual content to be adapted to suit new physical environments in a way that is pleasing to the user and delivers a consistent user experience. Another challenge encountered with AR glasses is the need to support natural interactions, such as allowing users to press a, press a virtual button or perform gestures to interact with you know, virtual objects that are placed in their view. These natural interactions, however, can be very difficult to detect and interpret, particularly when you consider the fact that you want to allow people to continue to interact with the physical world in a natural way. So as a trivial example, you don't want the fact that that I, the act of me waving to a friend on the street to be misinterpreted as a gesture to open some application on my AR glasses. AI will be important here as well to ensure that potentially ambiguous and noisy user actions can be correctly interpreted and that the intent of the user is inferred from uh, many potential alternative options. Yevgenia Razumovskaya is a PhD student at the Language Technology Lab of the University of Cambridge. Yevgenia is working in a very exciting area called conversational AI. What is conversational AI and can you mention some applications of it? Um, a group of algorithm which allows humans to interact with the computer directly through the most natural form which exists there for interaction, which is language, which can be both in the form of speech or text. Uh, in terms of applications, there are some which already exist. For example, um, I'm sure you've interacted with some sort of a banking board, which probably has frustrated you with not understanding some very simple things, or probably you have been amused by something that Siri or Alexa have magically understood and both of those are some of the real life everyday applications of conversation ai in your opinion how far are we now from machines that can hold a completely natural conversation with humans so that we can't tell the difference between a human and a machine uh, as a user you feel this difference in i think the feeling of fragility of the conversations you feel like when you're talking to a conversation AI, the backtracking of the conversation is harder. It's not as easy to say, ah, stop, there was a misunderstanding. At the same time, as a developer, I understand that this lack of flexibility um, of the model comes from the fact that we are in an era of data-centric conversation AI. So the model is only as good as the data we feed it with. And we get more data from more conversations that our uh, model holds with the user. So in a way, it's a bit of a hand and egg problem. And I think to make it really human centric, we definitely need much more user feedback on how the model performed and where it went wrong. What is the research challenge that you have chosen to address in your research? is to make conversation AI uh, multilingual, even in the cases where only a few examples in a given language are available. For instance, in a language called Quechua spoken in Peru, there is no way we will ever collect the same amount of data as is available in English right now. And I'm really interested in whether we can devise models or approaches um, that will help us make conversation AI work, even uh, in cases where really small data sets are only available. What kind of a positive impact do you hope that your research will make? I think it's important to note that currently even the more widely used systems such as Google Home or Amazon Alexa only support around 10 to 12 widely spoken languages. And this inherently creates some sort of a stratification of those privileged people who speak one of those languages and those who don't and thus don't have the access to the technology. 
And I think my research direction um, is, you know, a small step towards creating more fair distribution of the technology and more fair use of it. Hello and welcome. Joining me is Vishal Chadrath, former CEO of Second Mind and now embarking on a new entrepreneurial venture. Vishal, I'd like to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about your background in artificial intelligence. Yeah, uh, so I've been involved with AI and machine learning for uh, over seven years and mainly around uh, focused on making decisions using AI. So what's your view of how products using AI should interact with humans? So I think it's, a, it's an enhancer and it has a way to go by uh, taking over small bits of human tasks and going along. And if I give you a specific example, uh, these days we have quite well-developed tools for detecting cats and dogs, you know, sort of uh, image recognition. So the next step is to automate what happens if it's a cat or a dog or a fish or a boat, what do you do? And the next thing is, how do you trust the system enough that whatever it kind of decides after finding out what object is there, how to give humans the confidence to hand over that control. So what's your perception of how customers currently view AI? Uh, unfortunately, most of them don't understand it. So even over the weekend, I was uh, talking to some kind of entrepreneurs from the fintech industry who uh, wanted to use AI and machine learning for a new financial services company that they want to start. And they started by, oh, what can your AI do? So again, I think that's just being asked a question like that almost says that these people don't really, you know, kind of, you know, understand what is the technology. It is really some algorithms that you can apply for your own specific decision making problems based on the constraints that you have for the decision making and the data that you have for the decision making. Do you think that perception will change in the future? I hope. I think, uh, as with every technology, the first time somebody sees it, it appears to be an act of God. Once you start understanding it better, it appears to be magic. And when you really, really understand it, it just seems to be kind of good old engineering. So what are the current priorities for designing AI interfaces? I think the key thing is really to get the humans into the loop and essentially scale up from a decision-making perspective in very small baby steps. Because with, with, with each sort of a baby step that you kind of teach it to do, it will do things right and sometimes not too right, right? And, but for that baby step, when you hand over the uh, decision to the machine, uh, we have to be comfortable with the uh, amount of risk we are taking and the risk has to be like a weighted risk. Okay, so finally, what opportunities are there for collaboration between academic ethicists, philosophers, and social sciences in the design of these AI products? I think a social scientist for sure, uh, a scientist, academics, maybe even philosophers, but not ethicists. I think the, the kind of ethicists should spend their time, or their time would be much more usefully spent than trying to teach, teach ethics to humans, than try to think or teach ethics to a machine. So do you think machines ever will be intelligent? Never. No. I, I think it is the, the whole notion of being basically uh, sentient, or if, if, if intelligence is about being uh, sentient, I would say no. If uh, intelligent, intelligence is about making decisions, then yes, but then that's a machine-based decision. Professor Roy Reihardt is an associate professor at Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, as well as an affiliated lecturer here in the University of Cambridge. He's working on machine learning, the basic methodology that underpins much of current AI. In recent years, AI has undergone a paradigm shift in the basic machine learning methodology. So-called language models or foundation models are now hugely popular in the research community as well as in industry. 
Roy, could you explain to us what these models are and why they are so powerful? These models, they are trained on very large amounts of text, just free text from the internet. And they can then, um, the, the eventual model, the parameters, the estimated parameters, can then be used to, to can then be applied to actually any NLP task. And very, very, very effectively. This is quite uh, astonishing. Um, they are based on the idea of language modeling, which means that the model is trained in large amounts of text every time, in every point in, in the text, to predict the next word. Um, they also apply an interesting mechanism called attention, which means that when a prediction is made, the model should understand which words in the context it should attend to. There has been a lot of debate on these models recently. Can you tell us something about the problems associated with these models? Like any other technology, particularly transformative technology, they have uh, opportunities and challenges. Uh, among the challenges are the fact that it's very hard to interpret the predictions within these models. The fact that these models are based on um, correlations, which means that they encode the, uh, statistical patterns in the data. And this often means that they also uh, memorize things that we don't necessarily want them to be aware of, like, for example, racist patterns or gender balance. And also, these are very large models and they have billions of parameters. And in order to train them, we need very substantial computing infrastructure. And this infrastructure is usually available mostly in high corporates. There is also the, the risk of uh, pollution. So there are also environmental constraints around these models. In your view, how should we as AI researchers improve basic AI methodology in the future? One, one important thing is to design smaller models that are more accessible and uh, less dangerous to the uh, environment. Another important direction is to avoid using these um, um, systems to make predictions that are based purely on data and instead involve uh, human experts um, that uh, understand the subject matter very well. And the last thing that I would mention is I think that we should avoid uh, this kind of thinking that um, the systems can solve our own problems and instead use them as a decision making uh, supporting support systems. Um, you could also call this, um, um, this approach the human in the loop approach because it means that uh, human and humans and machine collaborate uh, in solving problems. I believe this reflects uh, the current state of technology. What is meant by a connected product and what are the major prototyping challenges? Uh, connected devices to me, they are physical objects that can connect with each other and other systems via the internet. These devices are commonly embedded with technologies such as processing chips, software, sensors, and they can collect data from the users and share the data with other devices or systems, like smart speaker variables. Um, it can be extremely challenging for designers to build prototypes. Uh, they have to adopt a more holistic view over the connected features, linked tasks, and uh, related contexts. Designers in such case have to face a much larger design space compared with some conventional prototypes, such as an appearance model or UI interface, prototypes of connected devices are more about the validation of the underlying logic of a complex system. For example, designers in such case have to think about things such as uh, relationships between controls and states are becoming less visible to the users, or a task has to be complicated across multiple platforms over the time. And the second challenge for me is the booming of such kind of devices is accompanied by faster developing pace and shorter iteration cycles. Therefore, it is much tedious. It's very tedious for designers to prototype connected devices using some conventional methods. They have to understand and um, 
learn a uniquely broad spectrum of developing technologies and skills. How can AI and AR enable designers to create better connected products? Uh, there are three ways I can think of to improve the prototyping and related user studies of connected products with AI. The first one is we can train algorithms on specific data we gathered from participants on how they interact with and feel about a prototype, a later improved design based on that. The second one is we can use machine learning algorithms to predict user behaviors in the user studies because sometimes the users can be very can be highly dynamic. And the third one is with some AI algorithms we can dig a little deeper into the data and find more creative features that we can to be explored. As for the AR, there are also three advantages of using it in the prototyping. The first one is we can use AR to bring prototypes to life. Yeah, because AR allows us to pull the idea out of the screen and um, drop it into the real world at a full scale. And further, we can even drag them to the target scenarios and capture videos of people working around the prototype, observing and understanding the presence of each concept in the in the context. And it also enables collaboration across geographies so that stakeholders can reveal in progress virtual assets in a more natural way than ever before. And the third one is we can combine AR with some other technologies like 3D printing and uh, to, so that we can test our concepts with expert users and gain val valuable insights far earlier than traditional processes allow. Uh, in total, we believe there are much more imaginative solutions if we can combine AI and AR together in the prototyping of connected devices. And uh, this will make the interaction with information and objects much more human, simple, and intuitive, we believe. Really, really hard, actually. Mm. Welcome back. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our presentation. Uh, now We now have some time for some questions and answers. Uh, you've already been sending them in. Thank you very much for the people who have already done that. But if, you'd, uh, if you do have any more questions, then please continue to put them into the chat. Um, if we've got time, we'll try and answer as many as we can. So we'll start with a, a straightforward question from Larry. Uh, what is AR? Would you like to? Absolutely. Uh, so AR stands for augmented reality. And uh, the idea is that you can seamlessly blend uh, digital information into the physical world. So you can either do AR by phones, which is quite common, and I think Pokemon Go is probably the most well-known example. But the more exciting thing is that you can create new glasses, like with a form factor of my glasses here, that allow people to observe the physical world with blended virtual information. And as such, it opens up a lot of possibilities, but also challenges, like how can people efficiently interact with such information. And that's a particular uh, challenge which is well suited for AI. Thank you. Right. So we've got a, a question here from Martin. Uh, Martin asks, does centering on the human limit the scope of AI you are developing? Anna, perhaps you'd like to take yes, that? Yes, I'll take that one. Uh, absolutely not. I mean, artificial intelligence is technology that was developed by humans, um, but it doesn't necessarily, in, in, at the current state of development, always serve humans the best. So this is why we are called human-inspired uh, AI center. But um, the focus is not only on humans, uh, it's on our environment equally, on, on the planet, on the animals, on everything to, um, to create a, a life that's more pleasant for all of us through AI. So that is, that is really the purpose of the centre. Okay, so we have now two questions which are related to each other, so I'm going to ask them at the same time. So first of all, SSRI uh, asks us, uh, currently the focus is more on explainable AI. Can you say a few examples about how we can achieve this with human-centered AI? And related to that, uh, we have a question from Anonymous, who says, uh, to what extent could anthropomorphic design help to mitigate people's distrust of AI? So really, it's a little bit about uh, delivering uh, the information, I think, uh, which is what we touched upon from some of our uh, interviewees. So uh, how do we go about uh, explaining the decisions that AI are made uh, to the people who are going to uh, be affected by those decisions. And I think, uh, as we've heard from uh, Timothy Rittman in the, in the interview, in a medical uh, context, 
it's very important that that information is delivered by humans and that those humans can draw upon their own expertise uh, in order to explain it to themselves with their own backgrounds. Those, those individuals will have a knowledge of how the system works, as Tim was uh, pointing out, uh, not only how well it works, but also how well it doesn't work in certain, situation, certain situations, uh, and that they can use that information to explain the AI themselves. And I think that's a, a very important part. The people who are using the AI, who have developed the AI, must understand it to an extent which allows them to explain it in terms which are appropriate for the person who's, uh, who's receiving that information. Did you want to say anything else about uh, explainable AI? Uh, sure, John. So explainable AI is really key to, uh, go on, you know, to, to properly harness AI in society across many, many disciplines. Uh, a key question, and because of a key re realization with AI, is it's never going to be 100% perfect. Neither are humans. So we need to enable people or empower people to both understand it and to trust it and to know when AI is going haywire. And part of that is creating models that can be disseminated to users so users understand what the AI is doing, where the decision is coming from. You can see a little bit of that if you go to, for instance, Amazon or I think even Netflix and they have these recommender systems that recommend you movies and products and sometimes they, they explain why this rec recommendation was made uh, for you. Fundamentally though, and this relates to the center, if you want to make substantial progress in explainable AI, you really need to understand the domain and the users. And the domains are many. For instance, I've been working in explainable AI in uh, manufacturing engineering, where people use operator assistive systems, which are basically human in the loop systems, where the user is working in tandem with advanced AI to uh, solve difficult manufacturing questions. And for that to work, the human needs to deeply trust and understand what the AI is suggesting. And the same is true for medicine, uh, for environmental science, and for many, many other applications. And the key message is that to do this, you need AI researchers to work in tandem with domain experts. And you also need to do human-centered research to understand the user's needs and wants, and the best ways to present uh, both how the AI mechanisms work, but also the AI results to the user. So this, I believe this center is really key to this super important topic. And there has been some work uh, on anthropomorphic uh, avatars, etc., to make uh, AI more approachable. That may or may not help with explainable AI. I think the jury is still out on that, but that is something that is as well within the remit of this center. Thank you for that. So we've received a number of uh, very interesting questions uh, about how AI might be embedded in society more generally. So be prepared. There's some good questions. So one from Steve. He asks, given the potential impact of AI on society, what is the role for public figures in shaping people's perception of and engagement with these tools? So how do you think uh, we together can, uh, and others can uh, influence how AI is perceived in the future? I think this is, is it's really key. I think everyone, it, it, this is the kind of technology everyone's concerned, everyone's a consumer of it. And every, everyone is a stakeholder. So I think um, we all need to take an active part in design of this development. And this is precisely why we are um, setting up a center like this, so that we can put people together, developers together with the users, and then have um, access to policy makers. And I think it is, our collective responsibility to make sure that uh, AI is put in the best use in the best way possible. Okay, so on the other side of that, uh, of, of that question, will, so Anonymous asks us, will there be a case for government regulation in situations where the public may have significant resistance to the use of AI? So, I think on a, when, when somebody might be receiving uh, help or assistance from AI, obviously if they don't consent to that, then I think certainly in our society uh, we wouldn't be enforcing it. But I think that might relate perhaps to changes in workplaces and job descriptions and so on. Do you think that AI might have a significant impact in that direction and how might we best mitigate against it? 
actually I know some direct examples in manufacturing engineering because when it comes to operator assistive systems uh, some of the workers may feel that they're, they're at risk of being redundant because in manufacturing a fundamental facet is to optimize for cost but that is actually not the case in fact what we are going for is increased quality and the way to tackle that is to work with the workers on the shop floor and their managers and every stakeholder and properly assess uh, you know, the needs and the wants and the capabilities that OAS can provide. And I think generally when it comes to society, uh, absolutely you will need regulation with AI actually. And I predict there will be significant regulation in both AI and social media in particular in the near future in most countries. And for that decision making and uh, in, in pol political decision making to be effective, actually we need people across again, right? We need human centered AI research. Uh, capturing uh, AI researchers, uh, philosophers, political scientists, and so on, right, to, have, to create the best material, right, for decision makers to act upon to properly regulate AI. And also I would like to add that now is the time to do that. We're still at the early stages where the, most of the regulation concerns the data sets that we are developing, the kind of data that we are using for AI. but. Um, as Parola mentioned, you know, we have bigger issues like uh, use of AI in social media and so forth. And uh, now is the time when governments are starting to consider regulating uh, AI around the world. And now is the time to have conversations about that. Hmm. Okay, so we've got uh, another very interesting question, uh, quite general. So from George, he asks, what are where, or where are the greatest challenges to placing humans at the center of AI development in today's fast moving world? world? So what are the greatest challenges? I could talk a bit about the scientific challenges and, and one of them is, is the kind of barriers that we have between different disciplines. So we traditionally had uh, artificial intelligence researchers working in their lab just developing their models and algorithms and uh, trying to make them a bit more explainable, having a bit of an idea how these uh, algorithms should ideally look like but without necessarily talking to the social scientists or talking to the philosophers or talking to medical doctors or talking to the end users of the methodology. So the biggest challenge is to bring all these communities together and trying to make them under, understand each other's language when they are talking about things so that they can work together effectively to create uh, norms that we could then follow when developing this methodology. Do you have any other I can, I can mention a recent example, actually, where we used a, a technique called Bayesian optimization to allow designers to more efficiently design user interfaces. And that actually allows people to optimize user interfaces in a more efficient fashion. But it also disempowers them because people feel less agency, less in control of what the optimization process is doing. And they feel less ownership of the final, final design. And there's a really, really interesting research we're doing at the moment, manipulating a technical component of Bayesian optimization called acquisition function to allow people to more directly influence how Bayesian optimization can work in tandem with the designer to create designs where the designer actually feels that they have a proper ownership of the design. Hmm. Mm. So related to that, I think this is a nice question, a nice question to follow. So Anonymous is asking, uh, what is the best academic background for a student who is interested in a career in data science and AI? What knowledge and skills should they acquire? And I think, following on from your previous answers, uh, that this is actually a very exciting moment in AI research because it does bring together such diverse disciplines right across the social sciences, the computer sciences, engineering uh, and ethics. Uh, so. Really, we're looking for people with uh, an open mind, I think, uh, and a broad range of skills and a willingness to learn. I mean, I think some understanding of uh, the algorithms that are involved and their capabilities is very important so that uh, they can be implemented in an appropriate way. But I think also understanding that connection between AI and brought in individuals and society beyond is also absolutely critical because, of course, these systems are not necessarily being developed just for academic use. They are deliberately now being targeted at specific uh, needs and requirements of society. Do you have any, anything to add? Well, this just a little thing I would like to add. When we are setting up the centre, we would like to also have 
educate students as part of that. Um, this is why we are focusing on graduate training, because we hope that students have basic training in some area, whatever it is, where either in AI related area or some of the areas where we want to apply AI to. And then, you know, focus on filling in the gaps. Um, for example, for it might be a medical student who needs to get more familiar with machine learning and techniques, and we hope to be able to link them up with that sort of training. And vice versa, we might have an AI researcher who, who needs to get more familiar with social sciences, and we hope that we can help that student fill in the gap in, in that kind of, so that they can do interdisciplinary research in that space. Fantastic. Okay, so this is a really imaginative question uh, from Jeff. He asks us, do you think that the representation of AI in science fiction has been helpful or problematic to public understanding of AI in the real world? Oh, that is a really interesting question. I know there has been some work looking at uh, how AI and uh, computer science in general has been depicted in the literature and in the movies. I don't think any research is conclusive, to be honest, actually. If I'm allowed to just venture a guess, I would say it has certainly stimulated the imagination of the general public of what can be done in many, many fascinating ways. And also, movies being movies, um, scared people a bit, right? <laughs> With, you know, machines taking over the world, etc. So I think it's a little bit of both. Inspiration and, you know, a threat. That's right. I do think that uh, science fiction has somewhat overstated the capabilities of artificial intelligence, even those that uh, seek to address the near future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so we're coming towards the close uh, of our Q&A session. So uh, there's actually quite an open question here from SSRI. Uh, how can we get involved, they ask? Well, in many ways, we are going to have forums um, where we hope that we have also members of the general public there involved. So you can email us, you can get in touch with us. Um, you can get in, uh, we are going to be opening our events to also the general public members of that. And, and if, or if you're working for companies, we are also very open to uh, collaborating with, working with industries. And also, as I said, financial support is also very welcome because a centre like this, we will need to have studentships uh, funded for students, um, dedicated studentships, so that be, students can focus on human-inspired AI. So in all these ways, so simply get in touch and then we can figure out the best way for you to support us. That's right. We are looking for people from all backgrounds, uh, people yeah. especially with an interest in business and how AI might impact on their, their own businesses, uh, people with interests uh, in science and science fiction even. Uh, you know, people who just want to get involved uh, and give us their opinion, because of course if we are going to deliver artificial intelligence solutions to uh, society, then of course we need to have as broad, a broader range of uh, opinions and uh, hear those opinions so that we can make the appropriate adjustments to the technology before they actually come to be delivered. Okay, we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, should we take one more question? It's a very quick question. Uh, it's just asking about how we might be incorporating uh, perspectives of older people and other people in poor communities with regards to AI development. Oh, I actually do some work on this, actually. Cause, uh, so we'll definitely do that. And there is a huge aging population and people with disabilities. And here, AI has enormous pr promise, actually, to dramatically improve the quality of life. So I work with severely uh, motor disabled users who cannot speak. And we have, for instance, invented a system where you can write with your eyes really quickly by just very quickly glancing at the keys of, the, of a keyboard using eye tracking. And the system will infer the, the use of sentences. And these kind of technologies can double the entry rate. And if this is your only communication device, that's a complete game changer. And more generally, there's a huge area of like care homes, for instance, right? So optimizing and improving the care home experience a lot of um, AI technologies are actually actively being researched to improve that. And in generally, uh, fall detection devices for the LA, that's a huge area here that can be explored. And it should be explored. And it should be explored with the users in mind. So it shouldn't just be technology push. Here's a fantastic machine learning algorithm or robot or whatever it is. Let's just push it down and hope for the best. No, it has to be market pull, right? So you have to have people on the ground working with the users in a human-centered way to understand people's needs and wants. 
And I'm noticing thank we're running out of time, so in closing, thank you for uh, watching this, and um, I hope you enjoyed this, and you can see the potential as we do with a, a center for human-inspired AI at the University of Cambridge. Thank you very much. <laughs>